Hi, welcome to That Groovy Scoopcast, your go-to audio hub for all things Scooby-Doo. Normally, we would have a funny quote for you at the beginning of this episode that we pulled from the episode we watched, but... Scrappy cried this episode, and we don't really have anything else to say. I'm your host, Derek. And I'm Shannon. Thank you for joining us today. We are excited to return to the 13 Ghosts of Scooby-Doo. What were your initial thoughts for this episode this week, Shannon? We really enjoyed last episode. That we watched from this? Yeah, the first episode. That was to all the ghouls I loved before. Yeah, and so I was really hoping that I would love it as much. I didn't love it as much, but it still is not one of the worst episodes we've seen. I would have to agree. But before we get carried away with ourselves talking about the episode, we are happy to announce that we have found our Scooby-Doo trivia game, and now we can commence the Mystery Machine match once again. Woohoo! Yay! So we had to backtrack a little bit to figure out where we are sitting on the points. Right now, I have 10 points, and Shannon has 7 If you want to get a refresher on where we were last time, you can visit episode 18, where we reviewed Strange Encounters of a Scooby Kind. And so, as always, Shannon, you can go first. In what New England town is Scooby-Doo mistakenly thought to be a witch? I'm just going to say Salem? Yeah. It was Salem? Okay. All right, here's your first question. Scooby-Doo creates his own version of what food while on a visit to New Orleans? Gumbo or shrimp creole? Is it gumbo? It is gumbo. Okay. Shaggy's sister appeared on the show with two different names, Maggie and Susie or Shuggy. It was Shuggy. Yeah. That was one of our fun facts, I think, at one point. Yeah. I think so. Okay, here's your next question. And I'm going to emphasize the keyword in here so you don't get confused. Okay, thank you. Which friend is a talk show producer in Scooby-Doo on Zombie Island? Fred. Yes. Ha ha. Because I knew that you knew that Daphne was like had her own TV Reporter. show, but she wasn't the actual producer of the show. Because you said producer, I was like, oh, it wasn't Daphne. It had to have been Fred. Yeah. All right. What's your final question for me this week? Name the witch doctor whose plan to put a curse on a rock group was foiled by Mystery Inc. I really don't know. Mamba Wamba. Oh. That must be an episode I haven't seen then. We'll see it eventually. (laughs) I guess so. All right. Well, here's your last question. The ghosts that haunt Mama Cass's candy factory are made out of what kind of sweet treat? Jello? Sweet treat? It was cotton candy. Yeah, I wouldn't have gotten that. Well, hey, at least we tied in terms of like us gaining points this week. Each one of us got two points. I'm still in the lead, but... Hey. Only by three. You're giving me a good shot. You just have to get a whole card wrong and I'll catch up. (laughs) Exactly. So now I am sitting with 12 points and Shannon is sitting with nine. That concludes this week's Mystery Machine Match. Are you ready to start this review? I guess so. Today we are watching the second episode from the 13 Ghosts of Scooby-Doo titled Scubra Kadubra. The premise from this episode is coming from Scoobypedia today. The gang heads to the evil forest to capture Maldor, but their plan is botched and Daphne is put under a sleeping beauty spell. Yeah. I mean, that's basically what happens. There's just a lot of craziness in between. I feel like that premise leaves out quite a few details, though. Like, they're not even mentioning the most powerful spoon in the universe. Yeah, the magic spoon. They don't mention the fact that uh, Sakras. Sakras. Doesn't even need the spoon. <laughs> He's just greedy. Like. All right. Well, we will elaborate on that further in just a little bit. But I will say that, you know, in terms of the ghost that we're dealing with this week, I think that he's actually pretty terrifying. Oh, like 100%. on his own. I think that Maldor, his full name is Maldor the Malevolent. Vincent Van Gogh describes him as a evil entity that basically terrorized humanity back in the Middle Ages. I think like physically he's really menacing and his abilities are just amazing. Yeah, it's really 
like you really have to like think about all the things he's really capable of without him actually attaining his goal of finding the magic spoon. Yeah. We'll describe him in just a few minutes as well, but the episode basically opens with us seeing the the temple that we saw from the previous episode. Before we even jump into that, I have one issue. What's that? So the first episode ended with them getting in a plane and flying out of the Himalayas. Yeah. To go find the first thing. When we first see the gang again, they're in a red van. Mm-hmm. The back red, in the, it's the red mystery machine. Which they never explain. Like the fact that they just now have a van? Yeah. Because initially the plane was the mystery plane mm-hmm. or whatever. The mystery machine plane. And... Now they're in a red van. It says nothing about Mystery Machine on it. It's just a red van. I don't think they actually explicitly say that it's the Mystery Machine in this episode, but I'm pretty sure in future episodes they do say that that's what it is. Okay. So. It was just weird. It's interesting that the Mystery Machine kind of just got a whole new makeover and also the fact that they're now not flying a plane like they were before. And no one's going to talk about it. Like, it's just now a thing that's happening. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they alternate or not between the two in future episodes, but that's an interesting observation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, The gang are driving, and, you know, they're just kind of on their journey to try and find the 13 ghosts. I like that when they're driving, they don't really have any direction on when they're going. Like, you know, they're just kind of driving aimlessly. Like, they were never given any idea of where they should go first. Because when the last episode ended, I was under the impression that they they were still going to Hawaii. Yeah. <laughs> they weren't they weren't going to deal with this shit. They were just going to go to Hawaii. And then come back and deal with it. Right. So right away we find out about this uh, Wonder Wand, which is basically the Infinity Gauntlet in spoon form. It looks, yeah, it's a spoon. And it has like five or six gems that go down the actual handle of the spoon. And there's one that's actually in the, the round portion yeah. of it. Um, they get a communication from Vincent Van Gogh via a crystal ball. And Vincent describes Maldo the Malevolent. You know, he goes on about, you know, how he terrorized in the Middle Ages and stuff like that. And essentially what Maldo wants to do is find this wand and then use it to destroy the world. I don't see why he can't do that already. He can't. We find out throughout the episode that he can, like, turn animals into more menacing animals he can bring trees to life he can alter reality yeah he like literally moved an entire forest he killed the entire forest and then like brought it to life he made himself huge yeah like he like as big as a castle yeah it was just it was very weird so i don't understand why he needs the wand to accomplish destroying the world he can already do that yeah like i don't know what the other ghosts that were in the side the chest are capable of but i'm already kind of scared well that's like (laughs) you know if these are the 13 ghosts like the 13 most horrible scary ghosts ever this was a great start i i agree when they're done communicating with Vincent, they suddenly get, like, I don't know if it was, like, a vision or something, but suddenly, like, the, the wall map. of the mystery machine... Well, yeah, because they were using a map to, I think, find the forest that Vincent Van Gogh was describing. Yes. And then suddenly it just catches fire. No explanation there. I'd be out. Out. And suddenly the eyes of Maldor appear, and he basically warns... You know, all mortals who are going into the forest, you know, Not don't to. come here. I will destroy you, blah, blah, blah. And I like that after that, that's when we go into the intro. Mm-hmm. You know, the intro. It was a very music. odd spot. It was. I don't mind it because we don't typically see that mm-hmm. often in Scooby-Doo until like later episodes, like until like later series. Yeah. What did you think of the intro, considering that we didn't get that intro in the first episode we watched for this series? It was interesting. I liked it because it kind of made it... uh, It made it feel like an actual series. Like there's some... Like things are going to happen, you know, because we see this in more realistic shows of like it's going to give you a little backstory about what's happening give you the characters so that you know what's happening going into it. So like in the intro it says like You have to find the 13 ghosts. It's all being narrated by Vincent Van Gogh. Yeah. And then they're like, oh, why? And he's like, because you let them loose. So right away, like, even if this is my first episode coming in, I know what's going on. I'm fine. And it felt really natural, too. Yeah. Like, you can tell this is the intro. It's Mm -hmm. not part of the actual episode. 
I will say, when I was younger, I used to have the Scooby-Doo Snack Tracks soundtrack. And it had, like, just a ton of, like, theme songs and other random music from classic Scooby-Doo cartoons. And it always included this theme song. Which is weird, because it's not really a song. It's more so, like, a narrated story or, like, a summary of what the series is. So, you know, I would finish one song on the CD, and then suddenly... (laughs) This is a warning to all living mortals. And I'm like, whoa. Oh, shit. (laughs) Um, Once we return from the vision. It takes (laughs) us back into the van, like right where it left off. And we see Scooby packing his bags and he is done. He's opening the side of the van. He pulls the the, emergency emergency brake brake line like a bus and it just stops the van. He just he's done. Well, and it was great because Scrappy Scrappy looked over, you know, like always, typical sca- Scrappy, and he's like, oh, that's not going to scare us away, right, Uncle Scooby? And he's like, yeah, uh, bye. <laughs> bye. <laughs> Meanwhile, we see this nearby castle. The castle is, like, dark and menacing. It clearly is evil. And inside is Maldor. Maldor is sitting in, like, this throne. And did he have henchmen right then, or did we just see him? I think we just saw him. Yeah. And he's like looking into his version of a crystal ball and he can see that they've arrived in the forest. Yeah. And they're like setting up a picnic. Well, I'll get to the picnic in a second, but like, I like that he's confused even though he sent a warning to them. Like, did you not know that the mortals were coming? Afterwards, after we finished watching the episode and you and I had kind of talked about it, I thought about it. And what I'm thinking of is that he probably had, like, a border spell, that that was, like, a warning that went out to everybody. Okay, so that wasn't, like, specific to to them. To them. Like, if you and I were driving past that forest, he could have, you know, it would have popped up on ours. Like, I'm assuming it's, like, a spell or something, like, around the border of the forest to be, like... Okay, so it wasn't, like, specially made for that. Yes. Okay. Okay, that makes a little bit more sense. We find out from this scene that Maldor has put the princess who lives in the castle, Princess Elsmeralda, to sleep. She's sleeping in this, like, glass casket. Uh, She's got a blanket over her. Just like Sleeping Beauty. We can really subtly see that she has paws, like a dog, for her feet. And you can't see her hands yet, I don't think. No, you could. Because later on, he had her whole body covered. Okay. But it... There's an indication that it's a dog or yeah. some kind of animal. It's going to be a girlfriend for Scooby. Right. Was my guess. <laughs> uh, Scooby and Shaggy, they are terrified about this forest, but they're also going to just go ahead and have their picnic that they were going to plan to have. Yeah. So they just grab their basket and they walk into the evil forest. Meanwhile, you know, Scrappy, Flim Flam, and Daphne are trying to get a hold of Vincent Van Gogh with the crystal ball, and it... Turns on and it shows an out to lunch sign on his door. Which really, like, he's an asshole. You sent them on this mission and you're not even going to wait to, like, see if they're okay. (laughs) Like, and Derek, you had said, like, you could just see him turning the crystal ball towards them. Yeah, he's just, like, setting it on a pedestal outside his door and just turning it to his out out to lunch sign. Like, it's just ridiculous. (laughs) So then... Scooby and Shaggy are out setting up a picnic, and that's when Maldor had seen that, had like saw them setting it up through his crystal ball. He got really mad and he goes, I'll show them life's no picnic. So he brings to life these two dead looking trees that are right by Shaggy and Scooby. They grow faces and their branches become arms and they mm-hmm. start walking and they basically try to attack Shaggy and Scooby. This is one of those instances where, like, from afar, you know, because all this time, Maldor's just sitting in the castle. He's not physically there. Yeah. Seeing Shaggy and Scooby. Like, he's just seeing it from his crystal ball. And he's already able to bring trees to life to terrorize them. I think it just goes to speak just in that. Like, he doesn't have to be there to cause mayhem yeah. or anything like, like that. Like, it's. I think it's something like, if I can see it, I can do it. The trees chase Shaggy and Scooby back to the van where... Daphne, Scrappy, and Flim Flam have now wound up as well. They all disguise themselves as bushes. Yeah. And the trees stop and ask them, you know, where, you know, the mortals went. And they all point that way. Scooby was delayed in his response. 
Yeah. He also had his tail sticking out of one of the bushes as well. But that's okay. Yeah. But um, that also implies that, like, Maldor brings things to life often enough that, like, they thought that they could just stop at any bush and... Mm-hmm. I like that when they answered one of the trees, the tree says, thanks a bushel. Yeah. <laughs> there were a lot of tree jokes. They continue on their way. And when the gang think that they're safe, this other bush that's nearby also comes to life and attacks. So at one point, Flim Flam goes, oh no, we're lost. And he pulls out his compass and every direction says lost. And like the needle is just spinning. spinning. <laughs> It's like, where the fuck are you? Are you always lost? Is this the forest version of the Bermuda Triangle? Like, where are you? And that's a question for you, too, because they don't explicitly say where in the world they are. It said the Himalayas at one point, didn't it? No, that's where Vincent Van Gogh is. Oh, okay. At the beginning of the episode, before, like, we actually joined the gang in the Mystery Machine, Vincent Van Gogh kind of sets the stage as, like, the narrator of the story, and he's in that temple where the chest used to be in the first episode. Gotcha. But it's never actually said where the gang is. It's just told we're in the evil forest. They're in the Bermuda Triangle. The forest version of the Bermuda Triangle. Yeah. They all pile into the mystery machine and they just start driving. I think that at this point, Maldor sees that they're trying to escape or maybe get closer to the castle. I think closer to the castle. And that's when he, you know, again, alters reality. He like, did he like upend the road or something? What did he do? So he like took his two hands and he like scrunched the dirt together to make the road end to make like trees and dirt and everything be right there so it's just like a dead end road right and then daphne hit the brakes and when she did that flim flam who's sitting in the way back (laughs) of the van holding the crystal ball he accidentally lets loose of the crystal ball it flies out the window lands on a lily pad in the swamp nearby and and just just floats away it starts bouncing yeah on the lily pad and cue the random sing-along of row, row, row your boat. Oh my god. So they're worried that the crystal ball is going to short circuit, which... What? Yes, me, yeah. <laughs> but they need to get in the swamp and go retrieve the ball. So Scooby and Flim Flam pull out yellow balloons. And they blow the balloons together to create like this water raft. I like that when they're doing this, Shaggy is like... Super concerned looking. I don't know if you noticed that, but like it kept cutting back to his face. Not yeah. not Scrappy and Daphne and like Shaggy's all collectively, just Shaggy's. Like he's like freaking out right now. He's the most important right now. No, it's the poi. Oh yeah. Yep. He's, he's just like, oh my god, those things are getting bigger. <laughs> <laughs> they hop in the raft and yeah. And that's when they begin singing row, row, row your boat. Yep. What were your thoughts on that? It was weird. Um, we had, I'm not going to say a spoiler from one of our um, listeners on Twitter, but they had notified us that there was going to be a scene in this episode that didn't have to do with anything else in the episode. I thought it was going to be this because I was like, in what Scooby-Doo do we ever see a random sing-along where, like, the words show up and then it starts bouncing. It was literally, like, on the screen. Like, you could sing along with them. I liked that they used Scooby's words. So it was, like, row, row, row your boat. Rently round the ring. I didn't notice that. It was, the, like, it was all ours. And I was just like, that's ridiculous. Thank you. It's the most ridiculous thing in general. Like, and then it the doesn't matter. Ball, yeah. And the crystal ball was, like, bouncing along to each word. It was just stupid. And then it also kept, like, cutting into Vincent Van Gogh, who's trying to eat dinner at his table. And he's, like, listening to us. And he's like, this is the worst song I've ever heard. Yeah. He was like, this is the worst. What was it? Dinner theater? Yeah. <laughs> I don't like that when they go to pick up the crystal ball, like water accidentally like goes over the ball and it spills through to Vincent Van Gogh's crystal ball and then it like splashes all over him and his dinner. Yeah. Like why? Because then they're like, sorry, Vincent Van Gogh, we're trying to find the castle. And then his hand comes through the crystal ball. And he points like it's right over there. I don't like that the crystal ball works like this. Where it's like a teleportation device or like a portal. Yeah. Like that's not what a crystal ball is. No. It was dumb. I didn't like it. 
And, and again, apparently it can short circuit too. Well, my biggest question is they're in the middle of this like swamp lake thing and this giant wave just showed up. Right. It's a swamp. <laughs> like where is this wave coming from? Probably Maldor. But then why didn't Scooby stop it like he did in the No Sharking Zone episode? Because he's apparently a fucking waterbender. Yeah, I don't know. That entire scene was just like, okay. It was a lot. Uh, So then they're going through the forest and Maldor turns this sweet, adorable little bunny into a giant dragon. I actually had a note right before he did that. Okay. Because... He didn't do it from the castle. At this point, he's outside in the forest with them. Why? Why? Exactly. Like, you've been able to alter reality and bring trees to life and do all this random crazy shit from the castle. Why did you come outside? Maybe there's only certain things he can do from a distance. I don't know. But but then again, he's they're getting closer to the castle, so... I don't know. He just wanted to come see these people face to face. Okay, well, like you said, he transforms a bunny into a dragon. Cut to the special editorial television no-nos. This scene. This is the scene that our listener was talking about. Yeah, this one... We did not see coming at all. No. Okay, so... (laughs) How do you talk about this? So, it cuts to the special editorial... It comes to Shaggy. Shaggy with his long, slicked back Draco hair from Harry it Potter. Was gross looking. Um, he looked depressed. He looked like a Slytherin. <laughs> 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 and he's—I don't even know he's what like he a news said. Reporter. Yeah, it was—it was all set up like a news report. But I don't even remember what he said. It was something about television no nos, and this is what we're going to talk about. We're going to go out to our guy who's in the field. Cut to Scrappy. Scrappy's got this microphone that, like, gets longer and shorter depending on who he's talking to. And he's also, like, wearing a little hat and, like, a trench coat. Like, he's, like, a a private eye. Detective, yeah. like, you're a news reporter. Why? So he's talking to Miss Cut It Out. Who's a old white lady. And Scrappy accuses her of being racist towards dragons. Which is fair. (laughs) He He doesn't actually say racist, but... That's yeah. what he's talking about, yeah. though. He's like, you hate dragons. And she's like, no, you don't understand. She said, and I quote, fire is dangerous and should be avoided. And Scrappy's just like, you want to put dragons out of work and blah, blah, blah. And it's got the dragon that we just saw a moment ago in the actual episode standing right behind him with a halo over his head. Looking Like, we should feel sorry sad. for him. Yeah. Exactly. And then Scooby comes out from behind him playing the violin, like, playing sad music. So, honestly, it just got very meta because when we cut back to the episode, you know, that dragon is still there. And so the entire time I'm just thinking, like, this is a scene. When the scene cuts, like... Scrappy and the dragon are going to go get coffee together. Like, this dragon is just doing his job. Like, it got very meta. I didn't like it. Miss Cut It Out does allow the dragon to stay in the episode, despite her racist tendencies. (laughs) And then Shaggy, you know, says, all right, well, back to the episode. And then they just continue like nothing happened. And the dragon continues to attack the gang, you know, blowing fire. And... What was it? They tried doing a gag where they tried to sell the dragon. um... Well, first they tried to sell him on his own. Fire breathing capabilities or something. Yeah. So they tried to sell him onto like investing in a restaurant and like having fire breathed meat and people would come and buy it. And he was like, uh, no. Like everyone except for Flim Flam like did a little jingle and they're all wearing chef hats and they're having spatulas in their hands. And then afterwards Flim Flam decided to try and sell him on used cars. Which were like the shittiest cars ever by the way. Like he was like this one was dragged out from the bottom of the swamp and like (laughs) it was just the most (laughs) random shit. And so of course he was like uh no. And then they were all like okay well then let's just run away. Well no. Before they did that, Flim Flam got on his knees and oh. begged. He's just like, please. <laughs> it was so stupid. Yeah, because he was like, all right, let me try one more thing. Please don't kill us, please. Uh, the con artistry is not working this episode, Flim Flam. Yep, sorry. <laughs> uh, so as they're running away, we get 
the uh, what I'm going to assume is going to be Flim Flam's little line, which is... I was is, just about to mention it. In the immortal words of the great confused one, ta-ta for now, and they take off running. What did he say in the last episode? It was like, in the immortal words of the great confused one, run for it. Yeah. I don't remember or what it was. run for your lives, maybe. Something like that. They were running away from werewolves. Yeah. So, I don't know. Is that his catchphrase? I'm going to... I'm going to assume it's going to be. I don't love it. but It's a long-winded one. Like, it, it was funny in the first episode because... Like, it had something... Yeah. And it was really fucking random. Yeah. You know? Like, oh. And, okay, well, well, I guess we'll have to keep a tally and see if this continues. Yeah. You know, in whatever episode comes next for this series. <laughs> you know what? I forgot to mention one thing. Me too. When he was trying to sell the dragon the cars, he pulled Scooby with him and was saying that Scooby was his dog. Right, because my question is, is Flim Flam the new Shaggy even though we haven't gotten rid of Shaggy? Like, who the fuck do you think you are, Flim Flam? You're not going to start dressing up and doing a gag. That's Shaggy and Scooby's thing. You don't get a catchphrase if you just got here. And then you don't get to say that Scooby is your dog. He's fucking not your dog. He has not been your dog in the last probably 16 years that this show has been on TV. No. So I... Disagreed with that. Did not appreciate it. (laughs) Um, The gang disguises themselves as bricks. Yeah, I did not like that. They all hide like in the holes of these, like like, in the broken holes of this brick brick stone wall that's near the castle. And the dragon just continues on its way. I mean, in which case, couldn't you just hide behind the wall? I I don't know. (laughs) So to get into the castle... Flim Flam decides he's going to act like they're on a tour, and he's the tour guide. Yes. As they're walking in, he goes, and next I'll show you the plush torture chambers. That sounds kinky. Mm. We know Daphne doesn't mind being blindfolded. And Maldor likes slumber parties. Hmm. They are confronted in this at this point by these rat guards. Which we've never seen before. We haven't seen them before in the episode. Except, did you notice, I think it was Scrappy was holding a uh, balloon that had a rat face on it. I didn't notice that, did he? Yeah. Did he really? Oh. And it, it was like a blue rat umbrella. Um, I keep saying umbrella. A, pl- a blue rat balloon uh-huh. that he was like carrying as if they were on the tour. So it, it seemed weird because we had never seen rats or like any other talking animals before. But then like because of the balloon, I'm thinking like maybe it was implied. But I just think it's random, like, these rat guards are guarding the castle, and they're working for Maldor, evidently. But, like, we never have seen them before. We didn't see Maldor bring them to life or transform them or anything like that. Like, they're just kind of randomly there. And why are they rats? Okay, so my thought with this is that because the princess is a dog, maybe, like, she has rat guards. And then when he took over, he, like, made them his guards. Because that does, like, it can happen. Like, I'm your new person, and, like, the week will be like, oh, okay, yeah, sure, sorry, please don't kill me. I don't know. It was a... It was weird. It was a weekly executed point at that. Because, like, I just don't get why they were rats, or why they worked for him, or where they came from. It just wasn't really well instituted in this episode. They end up being captured by the rat guards and brought to Maldor himself. Maldor... Basically says that they're all going to go into the dungeon. And he like... he I don't remember exactly what he says. But he says something as if he, he were like a judge. And that's when Scrappy and Flim Flam just suddenly become lawyers. Yeah. They are defending Scooby, specifically. So they're Scooby's defense lawyers. And they're not very good. They're not. I was so confused at like what they're talking about. Like, aren't they supposed to be his defense lawyers? Why are they questioning him? Why are they being so mean to him? Scrappy questioned him on like what he was doing on December the 5th and March the 4th and da da da. And then Flim Flam like objected and said that he was putting words in his mouth. And then they pull a strip of paper out of Scooby's mouth. And the paper said, bird, cat, dog, laws. Yeah, it was, what? it was weird. <laughs> and apparently, so is Flim Flam the prosecution? I'm going to say yes, only because like at the end they were like, oh, I plead temporary insanity. Oh, the case is rested and we drop all charges. And they both like shook hands and hugged and it was just. And then they kissed. Yeah. Didn't they kiss? Yeah. Or I don't know if they did it on the lips, but they kissed. Yeah, it was weird. 
Oh, what the fuck kind of core is this? I don't know. So Maldor then just is kind of like, all right, whatever, fuck this, and throws them all in the jail cell. So then also I noted that because when he threw them in the jail, we get to look at the back of his head for at least the first time that I paid attention. His horns are, you know, out of his head like normal. His front, yeah, the front of his head. And then they go through his hair and down his back. Like, they're not sticking out of anywhere specifically. Like, it's almost like he has them on, like, a headband. His anatomy is strange. It's very confusing. To describe him further, so we don't actually ever see his face. He, like, has, like, this really long cloak on and he... A scarf. Yeah, and a scarf. And his face is, like, just all blacked out. You can see his evil eyes. And he's got, like, wild hair everywhere. And then he's got the horns. And his hands are, like, all... Okay, I, I noted a few times that his hands freak me out. So, like, when he's regular size, his hands just look, like, very soft and young. And then, like, randomly they'll turn into, like, ugly, cripply hands. I think it's just a level of detail that we don't often see in this kind of cartoon. You know, because there was a lot of details that we saw in um, the first 13 Ghosts of Scooby-Doo episode yeah. that I thought were quite impressive. I, I personally liked it. I think it added to the menacing demeanor that we get from Maldor. Oh, no, 100%. It just, it freaked me out. I didn't, it, it was weird. It scared me. I think that it was Scrappy that, you know, was freaking out once they got put in the dungeon. You know, he, you know, he spurts insults at yeah. people. He said, listen, you horn toad. Yeah. Is that an allusion to when he turns into a toad later? <gasps> Scooby-Doo is using foreshadowing. How weird. Huh. Once they're in the dungeon, they meet the wizard, Sacras. Or now, Sagras. Or... Okay, I wrote, down, <laughs> I wrote down all of the different ways that they used to pronounce his name. Before we say that, so this entire episode, they've been saying that that, that spoon that we've been talking about before. Yeah. It's, it's called the Wonder Wand, the, the official name. It's the Wonder Wand of Sacras. And they keep saying the name all gurgly and strange and weird. They never pronounce it the same way. No. And and even like, it's not like every person pronounces it different. It's every person pronounces it different. And even that person will pronounce it different every time they say it. Yes. So you never get the same pronunciation. It's so confusing. So I've heard Sagros, Sagros, Zagros, Sagrasos, and Zagros. I don't think anyone knew how to say it in the in the recording studio when they were recording the voices for <laughs> this episode. Like, and the people who were in the recording studio, like, were actually hitting the record button, were like, we don't fucking know either. Like, just go with it. <laughs> it sounds something like this. Just Let's just wing it. <laughs> I did look it up. It's actually Sacras. So it's spelled S-A-C-R-A-S-S, from what I remember. Never would have guessed that. It may be a letter or two off, but that's what it sounds like, a Sacras. Mm-hmm. But they meet the real wizard, Sacras. He's in the dungeon. He is dressed all in blue, and he has like these really wide glasses. He's like a sad Dumbledore. Yeah, that's a good way to describe him. He says that when Maldor arrived, he threw him in the dungeon. He put Esmeralda under the sleeping spell because neither of them were willing to give him or able to t- tell him where the Wonder Wand was. And he wasn't able to escape, and he doesn't know how. And that's when Scrappy... But wait, because the way that they say that is Scrappy's like, there has to be a way out. And you just hear, no, there's not. And it was like, what? What? And that's how you get introduced <laughs> to him. And, like, there's a huge door that has all of these blinking exit signs next to it. Was it Slim Slam that pointed those out, or was it Scrappy? I think it was Scrappy. And Sawgrass is like... Oh, I never saw that before. I must have missed it. You're a fucking idiot. (laughs) So then they all end up going through the door and they like slip down three different slides. Where was the slide? I don't, I missed that. How did they get on this slide? I missed the slides and then even after that... Sacros is still sitting in the dungeon. He never came he out. He never went the down the slides. <laughs> <laughs> Wherever the slides were, Scrappy and Flim Flam end up landing on the rat guards. Shaggy and Scooby end up landing in the kitchen. And then Daphne lands in one of the glass caskets that 
is similar to what Princess Esmeralda is in. Yeah, and she ends up right next to Esmeralda. And that's when Maldor puts her under the sleeping spell. He says, welcome to the slumber party. So Maldor is all about slumber parties. He's kinky. I love it. If any of the 13 ghosts of Scooby-Doo are going to be kinky, I want it to be Maldor. Yeah. Scooby and Shaggy are in the kitchen, and they decide, because they're Scooby and Shaggy, that they're going to make soup. They're going to make Scooby-Doo stew. And so they start, you know, cutting up the vegetables, getting everything ready, and Scooby opens up the drawer and pulls out a spoon, a.k.a. the Wonder Wand. Not realizing what it is. Yeah, so he starts stirring the pot, And he puts it down and goes to grab some other stuff to put in there. And when he turns around, a bat, a bunny, and a frog all hop out of the stew and run away. He also goes to take a sip of the stew just to kind of taste it. And when he tastes it, his head transforms into the head of a duck, a moose, and a toucan. And then back to normal. And then back to normal. And then he... then. Shaggy comes over and drops some stuff in the pot. They stir it together. And just as Shaggy is about to take a sip to try it, an elephant pops out. What? I think it's supposed to be because in the good hands, it can make the whole world beautiful and it can create beautiful things. And so I think like them just stirring it, like I think it's supposed to show that even like the simplest movements can do a lot with it. But why those animals just coming out of this cauldron? Maybe those are the specific things that he tapped. I don't know. It was weird. So we cut over to Flim Flam, who tries to trick his way out of, you know, being confronted by the rat guards. He's putting something under, like, one of three cups, and he keeps switching it around and trying to confuse them. It's just a good thing that Flim Flam is a con artist. Yeah, he's able to, you know, work his way out of these situations. He pulls up one of the cups, and it's Scrappy inside, who has two pies, and he chucks it at the rats, and they run away. So then... Uh, I don't know, they run upstairs or down a hallway or something, and they run into Shaggy and Scooby. And so now they're all back together. So then they go, where's Daphne? And you hear Daphne yell, help! Oh, this is right before she gets put to sleep. Yeah. Yes. And then Shaggy's response is, at the dentist? Is that what he said? Yeah. <laughs> That's where he thinks that Daphne is, at the dentist? <laughs> like... Shaggy, what the fuck is wrong with you? Like, it was just like, oh, okay. <laughs> Once they, you know, find the room where Daphne has been put to sleep, Maldor says that she's been put under the spell until he finds the Wonder Wand and that he wants to use it to destroy the planet. Earlier, we also heard that Sawgrass confirmed, like, yeah, it can destroy the entire world. Yeah. And that's when he realizes that Scooby has the wand in his mouth. So he tries, like, you know, coaxing Scooby to come to him. Like, come here, boy. You're mine. Yeah, be a good boy. He's like, really? Give me the wand. He's really talking to him like a dog. Yeah. Which is funny because, like, you don't hear that that often. It was was silly. It was a silly, you know, ploy to try and get the wand Mm -hmm. from him. But Scooby does run away. He And then Maldor goes after him. Meanwhile, Shaggy, Scrappy, and Flim Flam are trying to awaken Daphne. They, you know, try, you know, just kind of tapping her on her face, trying to wake her up. They pour water on her. They tickle her feet. And Shaggy also used an alarm clock and none of this stuff is working and they're kind of freaking out. I'm assuming this at this point actually went into like a commercial break when it was on TV, but Scrappy was like super concerned about the fact that Daphne's not waking up. And he's like, oh, Daphne. And like starts crying. He cries and then it just fades to black. So like I said, I'm assuming it's a commercial break, but it was fucking dramatic. Like it was heartbreaking (laughs) because it was like, let alone have we confirmed multiple times. Like they don't get along, but like he genuinely cares about her. I thought it was funny. Personally. I thought it was so sad. (laughs) It just went from like on emotional scale. It went from zero to 11 really quick. Meanwhile, Scooby is now outside. He's trying to escape Maldor. And whenever Scooby is using the wand, it's like shooting rainbows Yeah. at whatever he shoots it at. Because Maldor directs the dragon to attack him. And then Scooby, you know, shoots his gay rainbow powers <laughs> at the dragon. And the dragon reverts back into a bunny. Which was cute. Maldor's also shooting lasers and other magical spells at him, and Scooby's using the, the, the powers of the wand to, you know, turn all the lasers and everything into flowers and shit like that. Like, he's just pissing him off. Gay power. 
Love it. So then it cuts back to Scrappy and Flim Flam. And Scrappy goes, Flim Flam, where's the chest of the demons? You know, we just had it. I completely forgot that Flim Flam's hoodie is magic. Right. It works like the Mr. Machine. And so he just started pulling it out. And I was like, oh, my God, I forgot about that. And so he starts pulling out all of this stuff from his hoodie. This is how I wrote that part down. I wrote, Flim Flam pulls chest of demons out of his ass and captures Maldor. (laughs) (laughs) So Scrappy goes, you know, we have to get the chest of demons, you know, hurry up. And so he's flipping it out. And he's like, um... My Uncle Scooby is, I don't even remember the wording that he used, but essentially, like, my Uncle Scooby's pissing Maldor off. Like, hurry up. Yeah, And right. so we cut back to where Scooby's turning Maldor's lasers into flowers. And so yeah. Maldor gets really pissed off and just grows to the size of the castle. Of the castle. Bigger than the castle. And... I think that something that was kind of charming, you know, given it's a Scooby-Doo cartoon, is that he shouts, like, really angrily, Scooby-Doo, where are you? Like, not like the cute yeah. thing we're used to. He's actually, like, trying to fucking kill Scooby right now. Scooby, at one point, I forgot to mention, he uh, used the wand to create a new wizard outfit for himself. And he says, how stylish. Gay power. <laughs> <laughs> so Scooby turns himself into a fly. Why did he do that? I think he did it by accident. No, you know what it was? I think it was Maldor. I think he said that he was going to squish Scooby like a fly. Oh, okay. I think that's what he said. And then, for some reason, the wand just was, like, was just like, fuck you, and turned Scooby into a fly. <laughs> it was like, fly, now. <laughs> and then Maldor transforms himself from, you know, being this gigantic castle Thing. demon into a frog. Toad, whatever you want to call it. Why? He said that he's going to become a fly catcher and turns into a frog. That was dumb. I thought it was stupid, but funny. And that's when he accidentally hops into the chest of demons that Flim Flam, you know, pulled out of his fucking ass. <laughs> and so then Scooby flies over to Scrappy and goes, help me. And so he goes to turn him back into, you know, Uncle Scooby and turns him into a Great Dane with fly wings and fly eyes and why, was, I, why am i blanking on that i okay. don't remember we'll that. have to watch it because that was fucking nightmare fuel <laughs> i completely forgot about that now that maldor is captured they go back into the castle and they join sakras who's now you know gotten off his ass and gotten out of the dungeon and they're like but what about daphne she's still under the spell and sakras says that there's no way to awaken her Unless she is kissed by a great Danish prince. So cue the great Dane Scooby-Doo. Which is close enough, which, you know, Flim Flam describes him. And Scooby just licks Daphne's face and it works. Daphne awakens and she's like, oh, Scooby, I have never been so happy to see you. And then he goes to awaken Princess Esmeralda. He does it. And like we said before, Princess Esmeralda is a dog. In fact... She's a Great Dane. An ugly Great Dane. An ugly Great Dane, but she's a Great Dane nonetheless. And so then she sits up and she's like, my prince, my prince. And then chases Scooby out of the castle. And now the castle and all the evil effects of Maldor have worn off. And now everything looks all bright and... Beautiful. You know, you know, kind of like middle-agey fantasy. Yeah. Kind of looking. You know, it was all nice and pretty and sunny outside. And, you know, Scooby runs off into the distance with Princess Esmeralda... Chasing after him. Now we kind of cut out of that to Vincent Van Gogh, who says that that is, you know, he basically says that that's the end of this story of the 13 ghosts of Scooby-Doo. Mm-hmm. And that's how the episode ends. You know what I just realized? Weird and Bogle weren't in this episode. No. The two ghosts that were from the other episode? Yeah, they weren't in this one. Are they in the whole series? Yeah, I'm pretty sure they make appearances in the other episodes, but okay. he wasn't. they weren't in this one. Hmm. That's kind of strange. You know what? And that is weird because they were hanging on the plane at the end yeah, of the Yeah, well, see, episode. that's my thing. They're supposed to be going and trying to keep the gang from succeeding in capturing the 13 ghosts. Why weren't they here? I th- Honestly, I think the next ghost that we're going to meet isn't going to be as scary as Mal- Maldor. And so I think Weird and Bogle, we're like, Maldor's got this. We're just going to head over to the next one. 
I don't like that because that means that the other ghosts are just going to be worse. I know. <laughs> <laughs> like the best ghost we're going to get is, is the, the first, first one. one. <laughs> so what was your Scooby snack meter rating for Scubra Kadubra? Okay, so initially I had rated it a five. I'm going to drop it down to a four. Really? Okay. Why? I think I had kind of forgotten about that news thing. And okay. like, it just really irritated me. I didn't like it. It was very like self-aware. It was just too much. I didn't like it. Talk about the rest of the episode. So like what the rest for the of- rest of the episode gave you the impression that it should be a five. So I, no, I did like it. Meldor was really scary. There were just like, you know, as we talked about, there were a lot of like weird things that happened that I didn't necessarily love. And so I didn't want to rate it like super high because we had rated the first episode, I think like a eight and a seven. I'm going to double check it real quick. I knew it wasn't going to get that high, but... We gave that episode a 7.5. Okay. So yeah, like a seven and an eight. So I didn't, I knew it wasn't going to get that high again because I didn't love it that much. But it still wasn't a bad episode. I still enjoyed it. It was entertaining. Yeah. I kind of go in an opposite direction from you a little bit. Okay. Because I actually did give it a five myself. But I'm actually starting from the opposite direction because I initially wanted to give it a four. Okay. And I think the reason why I was going to originally go with a four is because I'm confused at what kind of mood this series is now going for. We kind of went on and on in the episode that we reviewed for... Um, to all the ghouls I loved before about how this episode is setting the stage for the first dark and really serious Scooby-Doo series. And this episode just really just turned it up on its head. Like, this was not as dark as what I anticipated. Yeah. Maldor was menacing. I really liked him as a villain. And I really don't have any complaints for Maldor. I actually really enjoyed Maldor as the villain in this episode. But then I think about that editorial scene, which is really strange. The Mm sing-along, that really brought me out of it. And also the fact that Scrappy and Flim Flam had a lot of dialogue in this episode. They were a lot more into it. I'm pretty sure they probably talked more than Daphne did in this episode. I wouldn't doubt it. Maybe even Shaggy. Maybe even Shaggy. I would be willing to bet on those. Mm Mm-hmm. So I don't like that they're kind of taking a little bit more of a center stage in this story. When for one, Flim Flam just got here. Like we said that earlier. It's like, you just got here. Shut the fuck up. Mm -hmm. But then Scrappy, we've been struggling for a while with other episodes about his dynamic in the gang. And how, you know, Scooby is supposed to be the star of the show, not Scrappy. So why are Scrappy and Flim Flam taking the center stage when this is the 13 ghosts of Scooby-Doo? Not the 13 ghosts of Scrappy-Doo and Flim Flam. Exactly. But like I said, I think that the tone is a little confused at the moment because we're getting a lot of really weird kind of childish humor Mm -hmm. in what's supposed to be our first real dark Scooby-Doo genre. So I don't know. I'm comfortable raising it from my initial four to a five because... Maldor was just a really impressive ghost. I'm how ha- I'm really hoping that future ghosts are like him in terms of their abilities, their appearance, their motives, like what they're trying to accomplish. Like he was trying to destroy the world. Yeah. You know, that's pretty high key. So I don't know. I'm I'm really keeping my fingers crossed that we get future episodes that are able to do a little better. Out of curiosity, when did this series come out? Uh 1985. Okay. So with your four and my five, we collectively give Scubra Kadubra a 4.5 on the Scooby snack meter Okay. So next week, we are going to be returning to a pup named Scooby-Doo. Kind of a shift in gears in terms of our tone. I know. It's so funny because <laughs> it goes from dark to like these children's shows. Really cartoony yeah. children's shows. So are you ready to hit the randomizer for what we're watching next week? Yeah. All right. Here we go. Next episode is Lights, Camera, Monster. Ooh. Spooky. <laughs> <laughs> the premise we're going to provide you guys is also coming from Scoobypedia. Freddy is filming his own movie at the local mall, 
But when the kids encounter a thief stealing from the stores dressed as a movie character, Stinkweed, the real actor hires them to prove his innocence. All right. I'm in for it. I'm not recalling this one. No, not at all. So I guess we'll be going into this one with some fresh eyes. Woohoo! Yay! So are you ready for the fun fact of the week? Always. Well, this fun fact has to do with the 13 Ghosts of Scooby-Doo, specifically Flim Flam. Okay. I was kind of curious about his name and, like, why it's so random. Like, have you ever heard of someone called Flim Flam before? No. Well, I found out why his name is what it is. If you Google Flim Flam and you, you know, look at the definitions, it's actually a verb. Okay. And the verb means swindle someone with a confidence game. It can also act as a noun, which would be nonsensical or insincere talk. He is both. Well, it speaks to his yeah. con artistry. Mm-hmm. So, I don't know. I think that's kind of neat. Kind of. Not really something what I would expect. Yeah. It's kind of on the nose. But at the same time, I've never heard of the name Flim Flam. But at least they kind of had some thought go into what little, little character bit, yeah. he has. <laughs> All right. Flim Flam. You know what sounds good for a character name? Flim Flam. <laughs> so if you guys want to talk about today's episode, Scooby Cadubra, or the episode we're watching next week, or really anything that is Scooby-Doo related, you can contact us on Twitter. You can find us there at Groovy Scoopcast, or you can email us at thatgroovyscoopcast at gmail.com. You can also check out our website, www.thatgroovyscoopcast.com. And with that, we hope that you enjoyed That Groovy Scoopcast. Come back next week for a Scooby Snack filled time. Bye, guys. Bye.